The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Advice tech. As if it wasn't enough to be across TMD's Alpha Beta, Rule of 72 and all the other nuances of financial advice. Now advisors are expected to be across all the technology options too and there's so many of them. But never fear, Peter D is here. Join me each week on a journey of discovery through the software and apps on offer for advisors and advice businesses. So let's dive in, fellow advice explorers. This podcast is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Imagine a world of investment choice that goes beyond borders. Open up a world of investment opportunity with NetWealth, where you can access local and international securities, as well as bonds and foreign currency options for wholesale clients. Offer your clients flexibility, transparency, and efficiency with managed accounts, managed funds, and access to non-custodial assets. A world of investment awaits you. Discover it at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. Hello and welcome to the Ensemble Advice Tech Podcast. I'm Peter Diamantidis and the guest joining me here today to deep dive into Moxo, study technological innovation at Berkeley in the US, and I'm a little envious of that, is head of product marketing and growth at Moxo. And I'm pretty sure she appeared on an Amazon Prime show, Ready, Set, Startup UK, helping contestants out with setting up Moxo. Thank you so much for joining me on the show. Nikita Aya! Hey, I'm so excited to be here. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you are very welcome. Now, Nikita is kindly joining us from California, so we all must um, be very grateful for her time and, you know, visiting us virtually here in Australia. Uh, so before we dive into Moxo, which I'm really excited to share all the wonderful things I'm aware of that it does, let's just get to know you a little better through your use of technology. What's your most used emoji? Do you even use emojis? Oh, I do. In fact, I've been accused of using too many and my text messages look much smilier than I am in person. <laughs> so I would say the smiley face is my is my most used emoji. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. You know, that's actually opposite to what some what some people are. I tell my team all the time when we write emails, often they yeah. sound a bit flatter than we are in person, and I often tell them to give it an extra smile lift, like try and give it a yeah. bit more zhuzh. Right, so you're the opposite. You're you're a bit more effervescent on your. Yeah, I, I I always find my messages look too unfriendly, so I add a smiley, and then I'm I'm thinking to myself, hmm, now maybe this looks over friendly. <laughs> Oh, I love it. And look, we all live on our smartphones and they're attached to us permanently. If you had to delete everything off your smartphone and just keep three apps, which ones would you keep? Well, I would definitely keep Moxo because that's where we run our entire business and take care of our customers. (laughs) So Moxo, my banking app, because (laughs) that's obviously an important one to keep track of. Mm -hmm. The number three, controversial, but food delivery, my food delivery (gasps) app. I Good call. Lie on that. So food delivery, it is. Good call. I realized the other day that um, I get so many things delivered of diff- all different types, you know, groceries and all sorts of things that that it's become an actual exercise to go out and shop now because I do so little of it. <laughs> I know, <laughs> just, but I'm like, why are we being right? so dependent now on technology? But at the same time, it makes life so convenient in many ways. So it's nice to have the option, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. All right, let's dive into Moxo, shall we? So, for the audience who may not have heard of Moxo before, let's give them a feel of where it sits in the tech space. You know, what category does it fall under generally? You know, and maybe what other tools it's generally lined up against, just to give them a feel for where you guys play. Absolutely. So, Moxo provides digital interaction workspaces, and particularly for business to streamline their external projects. Uh, these right. projects can be anything from onboarding a customer to managing that customer relationship on an ongoing basis. We find that pretty much any business where there's consultative interaction happening between a knowledge worker and a customer, and again, that customer can be a partner, typically another business, a team of people, a vendor, or an end client, 
Uh, these interactions are taking place today over email, plus text, plus attachments. <laughs> and a lot of times we're in this era where we think more tech is better. So we work yeah. with a lot of companies where their tech stack is, you know, 5, 10, 15 solutions. But when it comes to managing the external customer relationship and particularly the projects and workflows that they have going with these customers, it's happening in a very disjointed way. And it's not easy to manage, not easy to no. operate. Things can fall through it's the ground. Absolutely. And I think, you know, for the listener, then, you know, when we think in our world in financial advice, um, and here in Australia, it's a, it's quite a cottage industry. So there's a lot of, you know, there are big businesses, but a lot of small, you know, entrepreneurial businesses, then, you know, our projects are that, you know, annual review for the client or that like the particular thing you're doing at that time. And you're right, there's a lot of interaction and documents flying left, right and center and other people that jump in and it can be chaotic. Um, and that's yeah. without then considering how insecure email is is to send private information, you know, private financial information. And so for me, yeah. you know, for a hub like this or something that Moxie, that can bring you further security becomes really important. 100%, you captured it. I think what we see is over the last 10 years, there's been a huge platform shift, right? And we're talking about my favorite apps and food delivery, but it really stands <laughs> true that it's influenced and changed human behavior due to the rise of this new platform shift of what we call the smartphone, right? We, we are so yeah. adjusted to living in a world where we open up these screens, we click a button and we get instant service. So that mindset shift, it's also been a shift in how we manage time. People, mm. you know, can text and be in 5, 10, 15 continuous conversations at the same time. I think that entire way of living has uh, influenced the way we now expect to conduct business as well. And there's yeah. a lot of these incredible apps out there and businesses where Really, they're amazing tech companies like the, you know, Ubers of the world or the food delivery apps of the world. They've streamlined this entire consumer process that used to be, you know, time heavy, disjointed. You call a cab, you wait for them to show up, you have to carry cash. And now it's I click a button from one or wherever I am and there's this whole, you know, external process that's, that's just set up for me. And I can go through that journey seamlessly in, in one stop. So, I, but I think that when you take the thought process and you apply that to business services, which is, you know, most businesses out there conducting relationships with their clients and business, it cannot be as simple as a self-service uh, journey as a lot of these apps. You're looking at high touch interactions, documents, yeah. privacy is critical, as you said. So, and, and a lot of times these are relationship based. It's yeah. some, trusting somebody else. So why would I work with you if it's a completely self-service journey? I need somebody who can help me through the process. And that's yeah. why I'm hiring you, my lawyer, for example, right? Right, exactly, right. And so, you know, in in financial services or financial advice like us, what's interesting for me, and I don't, I'm not 100 percent certain of this in the states, but I think it's a bit similar. Is financial services has huge dollars in it, right? I mean, it's got massive amounts, it hires huge numbers of people, but when it comes to tech for the consumer. It is way behind. Like it's been one of the slowest. And I guess there's concern, you know, it's security and all these concerns, but it's taken a long time for us to get customer centric about the solutions we provide from a tech perspective for the consumer, you know, like some, something that they interact with. And that's what I love about something like this, where it's, this is built around interacting with the consumer, your client, you know, it's built around their needs, what they need to do, where they're at. Well, 100%. And in fact, you know, we've had this question from some of the banks and firms we work with asking us, well, how do you change consumer behavior, right? How do you get a customer to use a new solution? And our answer always is, you're not going to be able to if it's positioned as a messaging chat or just yeah. another way to communicate. You're right. Why, why would I choose to, as the customer, say, you know what, I'll download this new service and use something with you uh, versus the way I'm used to doing things. Yeah. Whereas, if you show them that it's about streamlining their experience and providing them with a better experience to get whatever business done that they're trying to conduct with you, for example, in wealth management, you know, approving a transaction, setting yeah. up a grad or something like a loan application where sometimes the process is so <laughs> miserable and chaotic yeah. and we see our customers saying their end customers are just so fed up by the end of it because of the amount of back and forth and drop offs and just getting simple answers and the right documents uploaded, right? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And it's 
And um, when I think about also, you know, even for the client, so if we use email for those things, then if they want to refer back to something or they want to, you know, check something we commented on with that particular loan application or review or whatever we're doing, you know, they've got to dig through their own emails and nobody ever finds what they're looking for in email. It's a disaster, right? It's just, it's not a storage facility. It's not a place that should hold conversations really. Um, Whereas something like this, it can be sitting in that particular project that you've worked on with that client. They can just go back into it and check what they talked about with you and what what you guys decided together. 100%. I think you bring up an interesting point too that email and our our whole, let's call it perception of email nowadays, I think has changed. 10, Mm. 15 years ago, email was the primary form of business communication. And today, while while it still stands as that, barely anyone likes it, right? This (laughs) Anyone you talk to and you you talk about, hey, you know, you have a team member and they sent a document. Oh, but they had a question. Someone had to call in, redline it. I mean, those simple actions or business actions are trying to conduct, you know, maybe one step in a process can take yeah. so much time going back and forth on email. And I'm sure we all have examples in our own personal lives of working with different firms and how chaotic it can be. So I yeah. think that when you look at the form factor of how to design a solution that can solve for you know, the the external journey, a lot of businesses come at it. And in fact, I'd say this uh, confidently that 99% of businesses come at it from the AI angle of, of right. and, you know, let's use artificial intelligence. And that's great. But, you know, where Moxo is different is we came at it from the interaction angle. We actually see it more as augmented intelligence or assisting the knowledge worker, making their lives easier to serve more customers and therefore make the end customer experience great. Whereas when you come at it from the angle of automation, you need to think about, you know, the fact is I'm hiring somebody for their consultation or their services. And it applies across the board where the value of the transaction or that process is higher. That external party wants to work with a human. So how do you better assist that human to do their job in a more seamless way and, and have better control and management over the data and privacy? Yes, yes, absolutely. And and it is that fine balance, isn't it? Because all of us, you know, everybody's got rising costs, we're all experiencing rising interest rates, all these sort of things in business and for the consumer. So we're all conscious of streamlining and efficiency, but there is a line beyond which um, we just can't push it too far and we need to make sure they get that interaction and they, and it feels human um, to the best of your ability. And what's what I love about this sort of tool is even, I, I mean, I can see it with the the build out we're doing is that the team are considering using far more video because even if it's not live interaction, it's, you know, recording a quick video into the app for that client. And then the client gets to watch that in their own time. You know, that's still more personal than an email. 100%. We have a client who said that it's so great. They've had their advisors, you know, be able to log into the app. They can see, you know, a customer has asked a question and they could send them a quick video clip while annotating on a document. So it's, it's as though the client just sat down with you in personal uh, in person and you gave them this great experience. It was it was very personalized and it was dynamic. But all the while you could be, you know, in the Netherlands, as this client is from <laughs> biking home from the office or going to dinner with the family and still yeah. take care of the clients. Right. So it's, it's, it's better for both parties. And from an operational standpoint, you as a manager or a manager of that line of business or that particular, let's say, team that's external facing now has visibility into what's going on and and where the drop-offs are. Because that's a big thing too, the person managing. uh, How do you know in tomorrow if somebody leaves your organization, is that relationship going with them? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And speaking of teams then, let's just talk about how that can work, um, you know, from the team's perspective, but also the client. So the client's downloaded that, they're interacting with your business, then, you know, they can then be, have a primary contact, but uh, they can also, I believe, you know, draw in somebody that might be a technical expert or that, so, and they can be part of that conversation. Is that correct? Absolutely. So we've designed this concept of the workspace, the workspace being the one-stop destination to complete a process. And within that workspace, you have structured business actions. So those can be things like an e-signature, an approval, an acknowledgement, booking a time where multiple people's calendars need to be checked. And typically that goes back and forth on email for a while, right? Simple things that happen in, you know, completing a process with a client or an external party, Uh, something as simple like uploading file or collecting documents. Mm. And you have the, the opportunity to say, 
what happens in this process? Let me create all the steps in here and, and preset that process and assign each step to somebody in advance. So in a way, the workspace guides the interaction. And then yeah. if anyone has any questions, well, you don't have to exit or get on a phone call or a meeting. You can do it all from within there. You have a lot of unstructured interaction capabilities like messaging, video meetings, uh, documents and annotating on them. So the whole idea is this now becomes the one-stop workspace for that process. Now, as an external party, whether I'm an end customer in a high-value B2C case or you know, a partner or vendor, which many times are the end customers because our, our audience is primarily on the B2B side, mm-hmm. I'd say that you know, we wanted to make it as simple as possible and as accessible as possible. So instead yeah. of requiring somebody to download the app, uh, they just get a link to the workspace. Same way they're used right. to getting a link to a DocuSign or you know, some other act, simple utility action they need to complete. They now get a link to the entire process where they can dive in and take action. And what's interesting to me about that is, um, you know, an advisor might have an ongoing relationship with a client and they're interacting via the app continually, but there might be one instance that might be estate planning that they're working on with the client. Now, the advisor might not be the estate planning expert. They're going to bring somebody in that does that. Well, they can just take part in that particular space. You know, you can invite them in and they can interact. This external party, it might be a lawyer, it might be somebody else. They can interact, they can be party to it without, like you say, the CC on the email and make sure they get invited to the meeting and yeah. like it can all just happen in that workspace. Totally. And and that's such a pain point we hear all the time that somebody forgot to CC the right person, you know, and then they weren't on the thread. So they didn't know what was happening. And turns out, well, you could lose a client just in, in things like that because it you yeah. you dramatically impact the client's experience with your organization. Uh, yeah. And you're absolutely right. Being able to loop in the right people and also loop them out where it's not necessary and and have the workspace direct them on what they need to do makes it a lot more personalized, but much more streamlined and easier to manage for whoever's hosting that process or responsible for that process coming to a completion. Yeah. And it, I mean, it's... um. Well, I mean, one of the things that attracted us, we noticed, <laughs> I looked, so we use a CRM and I looked past, you know, into the past of all of our completed tasks and for the team. And there was a lot of, you know, follow up client on blah, 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 you know, like this, <laughs> this sort of the nagging, I call it nagging, yes. we've got to nag the client to get something. And so what I loved about Inmoxo is, is the ability to set a to do for the client so that then it'll pop up as a notification. I don't need the team to initiate or, or do something. This system can do that, you know. So And sure, maybe after a few versions of that and we still haven't got something, we could have a trigger that says, hey, send the client a quick video to make sure they get this done. But, you know, it's it's taking out all of those ridiculous follow-ups and admin and, you know, the silliness that we all get frustrated by that isn't actually the work we do or the value that we can add to the consumer, you know, on a face-to-face basis. And and the amount of time that gets wasted in that process, right? Could be yes. time would be put to a uh, new business or, or yeah. enhancing a, a current customer's experience. And that's why I'd say, you know, with the customers that Moxo has worked with and been able to have the opportunity to see their processes with external parties get streamlined. Uh, one thing we we can uh, confidently say has helped our customers is uh, reducing churn and increasing yeah. retention. Because when you're able to better manage these processes, deliver a great experience with the privacy required, uh, well, guess what? You're able to give a better experience to that customer in that first month when they're most likely to drop off. You as an operator... Uh, know exactly where your processes are getting stuck. So you said, let's say there's something the client needs to take action on. You let the system drive it, but you now see maybe in an onboarding process you're running with 15 clients, everyone seems to get stuck at step four. Well, yeah. now that tells me something about step four. Maybe I need to restructure the way my process runs. And you get yeah. business insights that are actionable uh, to, to be able to improve your operational efficiency. Absolutely. And I mean, I'm betting that you guys see some consistent uh, improvements that people get out of the system and maybe not even the thing they were chasing. You know, it might not have been the reason that they took Moxo on, but they, you know, there might be some improvements in, you know, reduction in the length of the processes and things like that, that just come about because of streamlining the way that you, we interact with the, with the client. Definitely. We have customers come to us saying, you know, the, the easiest way to track it is a, a previous process used to take us three weeks 
And now it's taking us two days. I mean, we, we had yeah. this example of an onboarding process. The fact that you can quote a customer saying we can now onboard our end customers in two days versus three weeks. And it's, it's just one such example. You have so many examples of just reduction in time. And the reason a reduction in time is directly tied to a better experience is because customers find it more intuitive. Uh, right. it, it, it's easier for them to use and it's easier for the operator or, or that account manager to not have to manually follow up on every single piece of the puzzle with each client. But in a way, the workspace drives it and tells them where they are. So it, it's a funny example, but we get this all the time. We have customers who come to us and be like, I'm just looking for that Domino's pizza tracker. And I want my <laughs> customers and, and vendors, partners to know, where am I in the process? What's next? <laughs> Right. And and it's tricky, but we see you can buy a great service. And in fact, the more money people spend, um, the more they expect a better experience. So that yeah. first month is critical in being able to tell people, here's where you are. Here's what's happening next. And don't worry. It's your turn on step seven. We're taking care of all the in between. And here's what's going on. Right. Yeah. And look, I'm betting that um, you will have seen a lot of businesses go through this process. I'm betting that there are some that struggle initially or, or you know, struggle to take it on or others that really swing through. Is there anything you see them either doing beforehand or that they prepare well when they take on Moxo that sort of really gets it humming and moving? So I would say in our experience, the number one thing that we've seen with the customers who are very successful off the bat is tying the use of Moxo to a specific process with external party. So what right. I mean by that is, you know, and when, when I would see customers in the past, there'd be some customers who'd say, well, this is so great. You know, I saw this amazing demo. Now, what do I do? How do I get started? Well, see, you can message me here and they'll tell their end customer that. Now, if I'm an end customer or I'm a, let's say a very large business, in many cases, like I've said, our customers, it's a business to business situation. So it's another business you're trying to convince to use this platform. And sure, it's under their brand. But if you position it as hey, you can message me. That's also not accurate to the value that a customer will get. <laughs> yeah. So all the customers that said, I'm looking at it from the perspective of I have the specific process I'm running. I'm running an onboarding process. Or when I'm managing these client accounts, there are these processes that I have to run on a quarterly basis, or I need to collect yeah. these documents. This is how I do it today. And I'm looking to reduce the amount of time, increase efficiency and spend during that process. Well, how can we map that to the solution? And I find that it just grows organically from there. Once you see one process in action, then you see the value of it and the metrics speak for themselves. So when you do one, I've seen businesses in no time running five, 10, 15, and then they you know, move process after process there. But when you don't tie it to process, then you lose the value of a, what, what the solution is di- designed for in the first place. Yeah, look, and it's a really interesting point because I know for for us, we sort of were a bit betwixt in between in, in initially because we didn't do that. We didn't go, all right, this is the thing that we're going to do or take them through or the purpose initially. And once we've just recently started doing that, it's all flowing. You know, we've realized and the team are getting excited about it because they can see the value. And of course, that's your first hurdle, right, is convincing your team <laughs> to use the new tech, even before the consumer, right, or the end user. Um, you've got to convince your team and they've got to see value too. Totally. And I think one thing that we've seen a lot of our, our customers do, because we have, you know, small one-person realtor firms, right, or there are two yeah. people working on a wedding planning business. We have a small you know, plastic surgery clinic, for example, all the way to a financial firm, a family office, a legal advisory services firm, corporate banking. So our use cases and our size of businesses range from, (laughs) you know, 10 10 users to say 5 million at at one one business. And and the one thing I'd say across the board is every single one of them um, have, have shown their internal users what the value is. And in a way, the value speaks for itself when you're able to tie it to a process. Yeah. Uh, that's part of why tying it to a process is so important. And I specifically say a process with your external parties because the user who's managing the relationship with the external parties immediately sees how it benefits them. How does it yeah. help me in my day-to-day life uh, better take care of my customers? And how does it make my life easier? Right? Yeah. <laughs> Those who don't care about you know, the customer, you would ideally hope that they do, but there are obviously cases where the answer is, I've been doing it my way for a long time. Why should I change? And the big thing is, you know, 
If your customer drives the interaction, you will want to be where your customer is. But let me also show you why it benefits you and how it makes your life easier. Yeah, absolutely. And there's lots of things that, I mean, we've touched on a few things, but, you know, digital signatures in the app, even I like the idea of a difference between an approval and a signature. So it might be the client saying, yep, I'm good with that. Go ahead. They don't need to sign anything. It's not that formal, but it's just a giving it a go. Um, or even um, there was an interesting one I picked up and we've started debating how we might use it was an acknowledgement. So it's merely saying, yep, seen it. You know, like I, lo- I quite like that because there's that mystery, right? When you send an email out, it's like, did they even get it? Have they yeah, seen it? Have they read it? Thinking about it? Did it just yeah. go in black box of oblivion and we have no clue where it is <laughs> and what you're thinking? Yeah, Correct. You're absolutely right. It's structured around this idea of uh, these are small but such powerful actions that if only someone could know, um, you know, it, it makes a process move that much more seamlessly, right? And it has yeah. such an impact on awareness and transparency. Uh, and and I, I think from that perspective, you know, we continue to build business actions. Like an exciting one we're launching this month, I mentioned, was the time booking experience where mm. – Times you just want to book a time, right? I mean, yeah. we had to reschedule and my schedule changed and I used your Calendly, right? So it's yeah. bringing that kind of experience in, but where there's multiple parties, maybe there's five people who need to connect on an onboarding <laughs> call. And man, I have gone through those back and forths on email and just trying to find a time where everyone is available and then someone's assistant gets involved. There's the wrong time set, wrong time zones. I mean, just... Something like that is so powerful to be able to say step one is book your consultation call. And these are the parties and participants that need to be involved. And I'm just going to automatically let the system show you all available times and you pick what's convenient for you. Right. Yeah. So All these individual utilities that we're used to using, but built in house in a structured way for me to design it around my process and really be customized to my business workflow with my external users. It, it lends itself to being industry agnostic, process agnostic, and and delivering a better experience across the board. Yeah, absolutely. And and I'm betting, and it wouldn't be initially. It would be the I I think it'd be the wrong thing to start with. To your point about you know attaching the on you know the initial use to a process, but but you could um you know there's the opportunity to also send content out via the app. So you know if you're actually interacting with your your clients, you know maybe you've got a newsletter or something like that. Well they're probably reading that on their phone anyway, right? So why not have it from within the very place you interact with them? Yes, and being able to broadcast that out to users, right? And it still feels yeah. personalized because in a way I'm getting it in what looks like this text messaging experience, which immediately feels more personal than an email, an email inbox. But yeah. in reality, I could be sending this to you know 40 different people on my app and great, now everyone knows of this new offer we have coming out and they felt like I personally reached out to them. Yeah, Absolutely. Now let's t- touch on um, security because it's clearly, I mean, we're all, you know, constantly getting spammed and, and you know, hacking is now becoming a, a daily announcement. So, you know, it's the latest institution that got hacked. So my understanding, you guys have a, a, sort of a bank grade level security on Moxo. Can you just talk us through sort of the the understanding of that and how that works? Absolutely. I mean, we are SOC 2 compliant, MIFID 2 compliant, GDPR compliant, and, you know, the list goes on. <laughs> but I think uh, a, a, be- a better thing to, to, to share with you and our, our, our listeners today is our journey really started with our founder uh, selling WebEx. He was the founder of WebEx, which was, you know, a very famous video meetings mm. platform. He was the first investor in Zoom. Um, and his whole uh, problem statement started with he sold his company to Cisco. And one of the issues he faced is using his banking apps with his advisory teams and how painful it was to manage these processes. And because of security, oh, well, he can't text them. You know, call the assistant, wait on the phone, print this document, log in twice to get into a secure email portal where you have to download something, scan it, sign it. I mean, it's it's actually awful when you look at some of these companies that are the creme de la creme in the industry and the best experiences and so much money spent on their tech. But the actual customer experience is (laughs) honestly pretty terrible, right? So- That's where it started. And I think, you know, the concept was, well, this is applicable to any high touch interaction. It's applicable to, you know, construction and real estate and logistics and business advisory. There's so many use cases, digital marketing and our founder experiences in a lot of avenues of life. And that led to the conception of our product, 
But I think early on, we worked with uh, the banking industry, one of our first customers that helped us really shape our thinking on how to approach security was working with Citibank and the very fact that we could deploy on premises. I mean, that was that's an immediate non-starter for a lot of banks if you're not able to do that. Yeah. And then the fact that, hey, this data sits behind our firewalls, it's within our infrastructure and that option is there. But oh, by the way, you know, as a result, when you get your first one and then five and then 10 and then 20 and then 100 customers in financial services, if you crack the financial services nut, <laughs> you can get into a lot of other industries because the yeah. compliance and security regulations are so strict. So in yeah. a way, we came at it from having these extremely strict standards and almost having to open some of these things up for our other customers, right, where you know, they're allowed to do more. And I yeah. think that experience really helped us design a product that is built for organizations where security is critical, but which organization doesn't want privacy? Yeah. Business and 99% of businesses out there don't have the R&D department, don't have the knowledge on what to build. So being able to get something off the shelf that's secure, where I can customize it to my business and, and really differentiate myself in the market from my competitor, that's pretty cool, right? That's yeah. exciting. Yeah, absolutely, and it becomes. Um, and and in fact, you'll laugh. We've um, we've we've named the app as it's like a member of the team, you know. So it's got a name, and and we'll, we talk about it like it's a human. And I'm even considering <laughs> using the avatar thing in Canva to create like a talking avatar that will be Kit, our app, you know. Like so, it's we're really giving it this human element. But the point of that is people feel more secure when it's when it's got when it's its own entity it's not just via email it's a it's a thing on your phone that's specifically from you you know it's it's like it's it's the bat phone you know this is the bat phone to our business oh totally and if you look at a lot of other platforms like let's even just take our text messaging channels you know sometimes the problem is that almost feels too personal when it's in the context of business the the beauty yeah. um I'd say the design point of mobile, I'd actually start there. The design point of mobile is very different than designing a solution for the desktop era, right? Because yeah. mobile, you have to think about the interface. The interface naturally lends itself to only having one thing open at a time. You can't have five tabs like you no. can desktop. So when we designed our solution, you know, we, we are, of course, platform agnostic. We're available and a lot of businesses primarily use us on desktop and then mobile is an adjunct or an extension of the process. But you have to design around mobile behavior, which is seamless, yeah. streamlined, bite-sized, back and forth, continuous on your time. So yeah. I think when you think about that and you think about this need for separation of services, that's what the app does, right? When you go into your smartphone, you have your banking app, you have your email app, you have your Instagram app. You 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 naturally have this separation of, of what type of process or what type of let's say, activity you're looking to do just based on the, the way the phone is designed. But if you go into email, well, now you have this flood of messages coming in. <laughs> and you go yeah. into text, it's like, well, now how am I supposed to differentiate between my personal messages, my business messages? And people yeah. want that separation. You want it to feel personal, but you still need that level of separation and organization. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. So, the security is all there. It's a given. I know in Australia, you guys did, I think, the Bank of Queensland app as well. So it's something you're, you're, you're already at that level. You know, it's it's not something we should be concerned about. But what about integration? So so things that um, I know that that's evolving over time for Moxo, but you're you're certainly on Zapier, right? So that, that things can trigger between the app and external tools. Yes. And in fact, our whole framework with is we want to be the canvas for where that interaction happens. Right. We're not looking to necessarily say, hey, we'll replace every system you have, but we'd like to take a lot of those backend systems, for example, your internal project management tools or your uh, CRM system or your payment system, for example. Uh, or let's say some larger companies are very tied to a certain e-signature and that's already mm. with approved. For example, DocuSign. So we built yeah. in a DocuSign connector where they could just take a DocuSign action, plug it into their workspace and boom. Uh, yeah. You're still keeping that entire business flow within the workspace and you're seamlessly combining all those structured actions and unstructured interaction in one stop. Uh, so I think the beauty of, of designing a solution like that is it's all about continuing to build those connections. And in fact, we are working on launching right now a framework to connect to any third party app. So being able to plug in an action, connect out to a third party, bring in that data, 
And it can be a back and forth. You can really set it up any way you want. So if something happens in Moxo, for example, push that data immediately to our C- a CRM or a tracking system, a compliance yeah. system, vice versa. Uh, so we have most organizations will have, let's say, a specific uh, file management service or a very specific booking service, something that's specific to their use case. It's very specialized. Um, you know, legal is a great example where there's a document management solution for case files. And yeah. we'll integrate with that so that somebody can easily pull those files, right? So it's not about replacing it, but it's also about creating that perfectly designed seamless workflow. And one thing I tell you, <laughs> you know, we have a, our, our marketing team, let's say, right? Our marketing team runs our show calendar. Now, my team might be involved in three steps in booking a show and some of the designs and the collateral of what we do for a talk. But there's maybe 17 other steps that we're not involved in. So yeah. imagine if I had to go in and learn their entire project management tool on the back end, Asana, let's say. It's great for them, but I'm the external user in that situation. Yeah. I'm only involved in some of this. I don't need to learn your entire back end software. <laughs> I just want to see the few things that I need to do and let me know when it's my turn and I can ask questions. I can see the history. Boom. So that's yeah. the thinking. When I say customer and client, Sometimes it's department to department in large organizations because they operate like external businesses and you only need to see a few actions and you need to bring in just the ones that are relevant to you. So absolutely, our framework is integrate, bring in external systems and streamline the workflow and make it as seamless and easy as possible to present itself. And it's exciting to to hear that because, you know, like any industry, like you say, everybody's got those bespoke or unique or something that's just because of your industry and what you need. And, and wow, financial advice is deep in that. In fact, we've probably got more systems that are just for us than we have ones that people use that are outside of that. You know, we're, we're only just getting used to all the others that are out there that everybody else uses, not the ones that are bespoke. So, so I think it's exciting to be able to imagine them being able to talk to each other because there's nothing more frustrating, you know, than having this sort of siloed tool that just doesn't talk to anything else. Yes. And it's a nightmare. It just adds more work then. Right? Yeah, absolutely. And you're three systems. And I mean, we have companies and especially the larger banks that'll come to us and say, well, we bought three meeting solutions. And then we also have a bunch of licenses for this document solution. Well, who's using what? Well, it's all over the place. And we actually haven't rolled out any of these yet. <laughs> And we're struggling, right? So that's why I think when it all comes back to thinking about what those processes are. And oh, that reminds me, I should mention, in some use cases, people won't see it as a process, but it really is. So let's take wealth management. You might run an onboarding process, but once that client's onboarded, you just see it as relationship management and advisory. Mm. But in reality, anytime the client comes to you and says, I want to make a trade or there's a new investment opportunity or you offer a new product to them, that's a process and there's steps yeah. involved, right? Could be one yeah. step, could be 10 steps, but those are all processes as a part of your account management strategy. Yeah. And also I think um, what when you start thinking that way, and it, it is new to lots of us, but when you start thinking in boxes and arrows, which is what a process is, then you realize how much, say, you're whoever's the pointy end, so it might be the financial advisor, it might be your account manager, whoever it is, how much they're doing that they probably shouldn't be right? Because they're just taking on that interaction and they're handling things that could be all sorts of other members of the team that are wonderful at doing those tasks. And so it can really draw that out. When you start thinking in processes, you realize that your account manager, your financial advisor could be doing far more because they're taking on other things they shouldn't be. Absolutely. And we saw that with Citibank. In fact, when they rolled out the solution, they immediately saw their advisor productivity doubled. They were able to do and conduct, you know, more business in less time. So you could argue in the same amount of time they were handling double the customers because they're not wasting time on these menial kind of back-end work tasks that actually many times the system can handle or if it's important, a human being in another role can handle it. And, you know, you can hand that off immediately and, and step right back in where needed. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so talk to me about, um, I mean, you will have seen a lot of people do some really cool things with the app. You know, what what's yeah. the, what are some features or elements of the tool that, that you feel like has some great juice, but somebody's done something wonderful with, but others maybe don't realize is there? Like they've just got creative or they've really tapped onto some value they could, you know, by in- implementing that particular feature. So one thing I'd actually say is in a, in a way we've built this whole flow builder experience. So 
where you can really customize your own workflow. Up till we had that, sometimes people would miss the level of power that all these actions had because they didn't realize they were even available. And yeah. in a way, Flow Builder has made it obvious that you can really customize this to your process. And oh, by the way, if you don't know your process, you can continually add actions on the go. And I think that's been pretty powerful where some users figured that out before others. Now it's obvious. So, uh, you know, anyone who starts can see that front and center. So I think that was a big one. Uh, another interesting one I'd say is also the backend management and reporting. That's not something that's, you know, obvious to everybody, but a large part of this is we hold a lot of data, right? Yeah. There's so much data uh, that, you, that you get. And we had a customer who said, because of how well organized this was, we were audited by the IRS and the IRS said, We've never seen somebody so well organized. <laughs> Every record is there, right? Yeah. We had a dressmaker who said, you know, we get clients who ordered a dress nine months ago and they come back and say, I never asked for this piece on here, so I'm not paying for it. And she says, well, you did because it's in the conversation and I have the audit record. So I yeah. think some customers that I have not even expected, I mean, you expect it in banking and financial services, but in these small businesses and industries to be able to say, two years ago, you said this. And, yeah. and it's shown me that I can clearly track that and have a great record. Well, it's, it really helps businesses manage their organization at a deeper level, right? So Absolutely. I'd say that, yeah, that's a, that's a big one. And I think, you know, for all of us in our, when we think about financial advice and all of us in our, in our sort of relationship, financial advice is becoming more and more about family interaction as well. So, you know, I mean, firmly in Gen X and for most Gen Xs, what we're all dealing with now is our parents getting older and how they're going to cope with that and where, you know, where are they going to live and how's their health? Like there's all these elements pulling, pulling and pushing people. And so to be able to have conversations that draw in even the right parties of the family, and let them take part in that conversation. Like that becomes really powerful when you've got one place that can happen and you can sort of coordinate that really easily. Whereas trying to see, see them on this and, and make sure, you know, who's, oh, which son should be involved in, you know, that stuff just becomes a disaster. Whereas having a, an easy way to, to bring them into a part of the interaction doesn't have to be all of it, could just be this particular project. I think that can bring some real, you can be the connector, you know? Oh, oh absolutely. And I think, we're all used to the family group chat, right? Everyone has, <laughs> or at least most people I talk to say they're part of some family group thread or, or thread with some some members and, oh man, they're constantly getting messages. And so I, I always say this, my 80, 85 plus year old grandmother at this point uses WhatsApp, right? Like she knows yeah. how to send a message on there. These are simple things that you'd be surprised how many people even 65 plus actually are some of the top users also, especially in financial services. And they find it really natural and easy. But yet you're right, the young, you know, 20 year old or 25 year old learning about, you know, their parents' processes and what they're going to be taking over and how to manage things can hop right in and find that this sort of a platform is naturally the way they've lived most of their life, right? <laughs> they're used to. Uh, yeah. So it's intuitive for all ends of the spectrum. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Talk to me about what's on the development path. You know, what are you guys got in? It, there's, there's probably some things, like you say, that are coming up soon, but I'm I'm curious also to hear a bit about the blue sky. You know, what's what's a bit further out there that you guys are chasing to bring to Moxo? Totally. So I'm, I'm going to share a few things we're working on. One is, of course, that external framework I talked about where you can bring in any third-party app. That's yeah. huge. Yeah. That, anybody and any customer can say, I'm using this other platform, bring in the data and push it back out and, and set up truly set up your process to match exactly every system you're using and exactly what you want it to do and, and honestly really streamline it to the level uh, that's that's perfect for your organization to maximize efficiency. So I'd say that that's one huge thing we're working on. Another big thing I'd say is our framework approach to reporting. So we've been building out a number of deeper reporting functions like I said, there's so much data in the platform, but what do you do with it, right? The yeah. ability to actually take that data and provide more actionable insights to say, well, based on these 10 processes you're running, you're losing about X amount of time uh, within this step. So things like that, that can really give you key insights on how to better run your business and where you need to, let's say, cut the fat or improve the process. Or, hey, as a team member slacking off, you can see that there's this one person who seems to always take longer and certain tasks, yeah. now you have that data and it's tangible and it's real, right? Yeah. 
Another big thing that a lot of customers requested from us that we actually are going live with this weekend is the ability to support uh, fillable PDF forms. So yeah. when you're signing a document, you know, and you've got this PDF there with a bunch of data to fill, you don't have to go in and manually set up each of those fields. We will automatically detect that that field is available there, set them up for you, and that becomes a form and an e-sign ready for you to fill out in an instant. And the system takes care of that for you. So there's Which, you know, yeah. a lot of <laughs> yeah, it is. It is, but it's exciting. And I'm with you. The the ability to sort of plug and play with with yeah. anything that that's really exciting. Um and it and it will mean that that because what happens with tech right is you'll find something great, but then it just doesn't quite play well with others, you know, and it and it becomes hard to make a part of the team. Whereas if this if if Moxo becomes a bit of a hub and then other things can talk into it, you know, what a difference that could make to the service that you could or the the process and the experience you could deliver to the end user. Yeah. And one thing I that, that got me thinking that I should mention is we're, you know, I talked a little earlier about our interpretation of AI and where we see it playing into any consultative business service, right? Where there's a knowledge worker and there's some level yeah. of interaction required. I think for us, like I said, it's about assisting that knowledge worker and streamlining the process by using technology to deliver guided interactions. So we yep. like to call the workspace almost like a guided self-service experience where you're guided through, but you can interact on the fly. So really, it's, it's, it's up to you and the system you know, takes you through that process. So from that standpoint, something we're developing is more automations. So let's say a certain action is completed in one workspace maybe that process needs to kick off another process or kick off right. something else happening. So you could, you know, it could be something like sending a message in another workspace or you complete one flow, it kicks off another. Um, yeah. It automatically copies a file to another place or schedules a meeting. So there's a lot of these types of things we're working on. So to, to again, further remove that manual work, use intelligence in a way where you can cut out those steps in the process that the system can take care of for you. Yeah, and I think it's it's an interesting thing with um I mean I'm sure you're the same. We talked about before we hit record that that we're sort of night people so we get, you know, great work done at night. And one of the challenges when you're like that is, you know, the the businesses you might interact with and I mean even personally that you need to get things done. Um yeah. Aren't, aren't awake, right? You're you're getting things done and they're not awake, and so you send off emails and you do whatever. I'm curious about what you guys are thinking about doing. Now, out of hours, somebody, a client leaves a message in Moxo. Whether there's an element of some of that AI chat that could occur for out of hours when there isn't somebody around to answer some questions, whether it could point the client to some information that might get them part way, or even give them a heads up about the information the person might need when they do come online. Is there any of those sort of thoughts that you guys are sort of you know? I guess, brainstorming on? Yeah, I'd say today we're in the exploration stages. I think mm. we work with companies where they have their own bot framework. Uh, and so we'll integrate with what they have. We have the framework yep. to do that within our product. But we're looking and exploring at what we build in-house in a way. Because again, like you said, today we have the ability to set out of office hours and things like that. But how do you take it a step further and guide the client maybe towards the right help source that they need? Or maybe right them towards something as a result of the type of query uh, they have. That's something we're, I'd say, in the exploration stages in. Yeah, and it's an interesting, I mean, we've even got to the point of having, you know, just some materials that will help people sort of self-serve a little just yeah. so that they can make some progress. And then when we, you know, get back in touch, um, then they're a little further along and they feel like they've managed to take some action and, and almost tick something off their list. You know, it's about them feeling good about taking, you know, some to-dos that they're yeah. hanging over their head and getting them done. Well, it's interesting you say that because something we're working on is having this idea of filing a service request. So basically, it's almost like choosing from a menu of options. Let's say the client's sitting there, different time zone, someone's not available, but they need to get something done and they have a request. They can file that request and have it automatically kick off a flow workspace where yeah. it assigns the right people. It brings in the right parties. And that's something a lot of businesses want because in a way, you could technically offer a menu of services and someone can say, this is the one I want and have the system kick off the service and direct the right actions to happen. So yeah. in a way, even if somebody's not awake and there's 10 hours that passes before somebody gets back to them, they don't feel like they've been left in the dark. They actually already have a response because uh, a number of things have happened and, and the process has started. And it's got off their plate onto somebody else's. 
You know, that's that's yep. what the client needs to feel like. Yes, it's been submitted. I know that they'll get to it. Not, mm, I'm not sure. Do I need to follow up? Do I, you know, it's it's the vagueness is a problem. Letting them offload so that then you can then action it. I, I don't necessarily believe every business needs to be 24-7 and I think that would be crazy making, to be quite yeah. honest. However, <laughs> however, having something that lets people take some action in their own time, I think yeah. can be quite powerful. I couldn't agree more. And I think we, we've got that question in the past, you know, not, not nowadays, but we used to get the question when our, before our flow workspace was built, where we made it obvious, you know, what the solution is built for. We get the question of, but do people now expect me to respond 24 hours a day? And the response is no, because it's the same way. Are you expected to respond to email or text messages 24 hours a day? No, but actually when you bring it into your personal channels, you are in a way, because it feels yeah. like it's reaching you personally. But when it's in this uh, you know, form factor of what I like to think of as a continuous meeting, then mm. technically you respond in and out as you want. But the system itself and the way it's designed makes the users involved feel like they're interacting with someone in the process, right? It's on my time and your time, it's, it's, but it's continuous in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Is there anything else we've missed? I feel like we've covered a lot of elements of the app. Oh, one thing we haven't covered actually that, that yeah. I found quite fun is, is you end up um, with your own app, you know, so you do end up with your businesses, you know, an app that sits on the app store and things like that. So that's, that's exciting and it can be branded to you. And once again, is another way of making this like, you know, the bat phone to your business. Um, it makes it very personal. It's not just them logging into text messages or, or email. This is them talking to you specifically. Yeah. And I'm, I'm almost sad. I, I forgot to mention that till now, but you know, in a way that is an innate value and, and it's really our design point again, it's not about Moxo, but it's about your business. And yeah, I think when you tell customers or vendors or partners, right, whoever is in that role of the external party, you tell your external users to use a third party application. That's always difficult versus saying it's my business's solution. It's my workspace. It's under my brand. That's powerful. Mm. And a lot of times it costs a ton of money to build an app. I mean, I've seen so many businesses we've talked to in the past that tried to be mobile first. They, they, they spent, you know, I'd say upwards of 50, 60 K and it's a lot of money yeah. and they get that presents stagnant content and you can barely do anything on the app and it's painful. So yeah. knowing what to build, how to build it and having that association that it's under your brand. So from a security and compliance perspective, of course, that's great. But the second thing is from a marketing perspective and an adoption perspective, being able to send out this workspace and say, hey, we're going to run this process under my app. And oh, by the way, it's all branded. It, 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 it's truly my space. It speaks for itself. You don't even have to tell your customers that. And it sets yeah. your organization apart. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, exciting. I feel like a covered loss. Is there any last things you wanted to, to leave the audience with? Well, I would just say, I, I think when adopting new technology and thinking about what tech to buy and why, right? And especially in the advice tech side, that means you are running some type of consultative process. Your business has some consultation in there. It's not completely self-service. You're not, you know, ordering food or calling a car. So mm. when that human interaction is involved, I'd say be clear on the process you're running. Look at how you're running it today uh, and, and tie that process to the technology you're purchasing and make sure it solves for those gaps in the process. Because uh, otherwise, you can end up with a large tech stack and, you know, not not enough uh, <laughs> ROI to demonstrate what that tech is doing to really help your business. And it's expensive for most businesses out there. I mean, we see this even for the large businesses. They want to build it themselves. They'll spend, you know, millions of dollars and still not know what to build and, and, and not see any increase in user adoption or retention. So it's really important to tie the, the use of new technology to a specific purpose. And then like we say at Moxo, a specific process with those external users. And that's going to that's what's going to differentiate your organization from another in the, in the end of the day of how lean and efficient you can be. And, and in the end of the day, it's about increasing your retention and impacting your churn numbers and reducing them. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. 
All right, Advice Explorers, if you'd like to find out more about Moxo, then the website link is in the show notes. Um, and I'll include uh, the appropriate LinkedIn details for the Australian representative, um, rather than Nikita herself, for the Australian representative of, of Moxo so that they can get you um, set up and talking and they can talk you through your use case. Thank you so much for joining us here today and really sharing how Moxo can help us take our client experience to the next level. Thank you so much. I had such a great time here and look forward to connecting again. So I'm betting you're probably not a current user of Moxo. This is probably new to to many of you. There'll be a handful. Maybe you've done some digging um, and heard it mentioned, maybe even by myself um, at a session. But uh, I'm curious what your what that prompted for you. You know, what, what got you thinking? What got you debating what you should be doing about the way we interact with clients? It may not be you choose something like Moxo, but thinking about client portals, apps, the way we interact, where they live, how that works. You know, it's a great debate to have. And so please share your insights on the Ensemble Community Platform and let's get that debate going and get more of us thinking a bit creatively. Creatively. Oh, that's a hard word to say. Creatively? There we go. Oh my goodness. (laughs) It's Friday, folks. I'm recording this on a Friday. I'm halfway through the day. It's getting tough. So thank you for your patience. But either way, Get on the community and let's talk about this. Let's get this moving so we can really lift our game in terms of, you know, our client experience. Now, in terms of my thoughts on this, there's a couple of things that I just wanted to highlight. Now, I should confess that that uh, for our business, um, we're going down the path for um, – uh, implementing Moxo, uh, and so I'm a little further ahead than you might be on these thoughts. But, you know, people sort of, I've had people pull me up a couple of times and say, when you say, you know, that email isn't secure and, and a portal is better, why is it better? You know, what what's the difference? And clearly, you know, bank rate security, all those sort of things sound great. And that absolutely lifts the security. But there's something else that's about behavior and location that I think is an important point. Email is a bit like you were running your business in a food in a busy food court, right? You might be sitting at a table with your client and you're having a conversation, but there'll be all sorts of people coming in and out that out of that food court, and you have no way of controlling that, right? They're coming in and out, they're doing their thing, they're walking past, they're chatting away, and potentially can overhear. Now that's sort of how email works because anybody can have your email address. Anybody can have your client's email address, right? And so there's an opportunity for them to walk into that food court, <laughs> proverbially speaking, and and witness an interaction or essentially hack into that conversation. So, you know, that is the challenge because, of course, we wouldn't have our client meetings based in a food court <laughs> with, that was busy and people all around and, and chatting and potentially could overhear the personal details we're, we're discussing with the client. So, so that's sort of in my head, that's the picture I have for email. Whereas a portal like this, that's your app, the client needs to be told about to know to download it, and then they're going to interact with you personally and only them through that portal. This is like the, the private club where Nobody knows it exists, right? So they've got to know it exists. They go down that laneway. There's a big burly dude at the door in front of a single door. He checks you out. You've got to know the secret handshake. They let you in. And when you go in the door, it's just you and the client, right? So it, this isn't full of people. It isn't full of everybody else. It's you and the client, maybe your team and the client, right? So it's the VIP solo club, right? And that's the portal. That's the difference. It's quite a different way to interact and it's just with your team, right? And it's particularly narrow and private. So that's the sort of the difference I wanted to highlight that is a shift in the way people behave and the way they interact and hence the risk that they are exposed to. Um, I love Nikita's analogy there too, where she's like, oh, we're all used to the family group chat, right? We so are. I mean, I'm sure every one of us has got at least one of those or even a family friend chat, you know, sorry, a friend group chat. Um, you know, we've all got those things. But how interesting is is that as a concept when we think about the massive intergenerational wealth transfer that's coming and the fact that many of us are going to need to be that connective tissue between the different uh, you know, layers or generations of a family, and we're keen to be that connective tissue, then having a tool that lets 
and in fact encourages you to bring in elements of the family for certain projects you're working on for that client or for certain discussions or debates or in, you know information or whatever it might be, having something that really facilitates that easily and sets you apart as being ready to do that in a simple and um, you know easy to use fashion. I mean, wow, that's that's a differentiator. You know, that's going to set you up to be ready for that transfer and ready for your clients to want to involve their family and want to, um, you know, share what they're doing with them, but maybe not all they're doing, you know. And so you can say, look, that's all right. This particular conversation we want to have, let's fold them in, right? And they can see the chat, they can interact, they can see the documents, but they won't see everything else. You know, these things, these tools, really powerful, um, my belief is. So the last thing I do want to just mention um, – when you're talking about technology and you're talking about technology for clients and every portal provider in our market, every, anybody that's ever built anything for clients gets this pushback, which is, well, oh, but older clients won't use it, right? <laughs> oh, but they're not tech savvy, you know, and I get it. Uh, we've all got different levels of tech curiosity and interest. The thing is, the only requirement for somebody to be able to use an app is that they have a smartphone. So if you think about your family members, just as an example, your older older family members, do they have a smartphone? The answer is yes, then they are able to use an app. And I I make that distinguish, I, I point that out because I think we can get in our heads about imagining how tech savvy they are or aren't, when in reality, they've been forced to be by the world around them to a certain extent. Everybody had to learn or almost everybody had to learn how to use QR codes, through lockdowns, right? So so there's an element that with some care and some help from your team, anybody can use these apps because they've got a smartphone. Now, the other thing is, and this was an accidental discovery by us when we were talking about this with clients, is that the older clients potentially have less apps on their smartphone. So, you know, if you were to come to me and say, Peter, I need you to download this app, I'd like, yeah, no problem. However, when I go to download the app, it goes like four screens in to my phone, right? So you've got to swipe, 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 swipe to get to the app. Whereas an old an older client who perhaps doesn't have anywhere near the number of, of apps on their phone, you're going to be on prime real estate. That new app, that new portal that they talk to you on is probably going to be on the home screen. You know, that's powerful. You know, that's a big deal to be on that real estate for when they turn the phone on, there you are again. They can see you right there, right? So I think we we probably need to shift our mindset a little with all the clients, certainly be understanding and, and helpful in terms of teaching them how to use these tools. But wow, I think we're probably um, treating them with a little less uh, respect in terms of their ability to do these things than we can. I think they're more than capable. We've just got to approach it the right way. So now, as you know, there's only one skill we need to become bionic advisors, folks. And I'm hoping you all want to be bionic advisors, that wonderful com- combination of human and, and, you know, empathetic advisor powered by wonderful technology, right? And we know that this one skill we need as bionic advisors is simply avid curiosity. So each week, as you know, to help you build that app at app, you know, in the curiosity corner part, we take a look at a particular website or tool out there. Now this week, the website I'd love you to take a look at is airpano.com. That's A-I-R-P-A-N-O.com. Now this particular one is for you personally. This is this is my gift to you as a bit of an energy boost, as a bit of a uh, filling, you know, your soul and and your enthusiasm to get you going in life and really enjoying things. Because Airpano features hundreds of high resolution aerial, three hundred and sixty degree photos and videos of the most scenic locations around the world. Right. So all the places you've never got to yet that maybe you've wanted to, a whole lot that you maybe never realized was so stunning and, and incredible and fascinating and and something that really drives you, oh, I want to get out and travel and just fill the bucket again. Air Pano is the place to go to sort of get that energy and really drive yourself to book that next trip or maybe even the next overseas conference that you tack the trip onto. Um, I guess 
you know, I want to suggest this because, hey, is it advice tech? No, this is about inspiration. This is about using some technology to to really drive us and energize us. Um, you know, we need to feed our inner explorer, you know, and keep adding places to the list of sort of future traveling adventures we're going to have. Um, but fair warning, this is one of those sites that could potentially devour hours once you dive in. So I would recommend the first look that you take at this is more like, you know, on the couch, you're chilling and you just check it out because you could be there for quite some time. You're probably going to want to turn your iPad or your phone to your partner and say, oh, look at this. We need to go there, right? So don't do it in work hours. Uh, check it out out of hours, but I'd love to hear what caught your eye. And if you suddenly have planned a whole lot of trips, having gone to the website. Well, that's all we've got for this week. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you'll get your advice tech fix automatically sent to you each Friday. And if you are stuck in a rut on your sort of process and tech projects going forward, you feel a need to really step back and block out a day, maybe later on in the year for some planning for 2024. I mean, can you believe it already? We're already three quarters of the way through the year. Um, you might be thinking, hey, I want to get everybody, you know, in one place for a day and, and really just get ourselves, you know, set and organized for 2024. Then I'd love to facilitate a brainstorming session for your team. We can draw out the next best projects for the business business. We can debate what tech might assist with that and then get them all innovating together as a group. Um, I'm in fact already taking bookings for late October and November, so we're, we're getting sort of booked up. Um, but if you're curious uh, and you just want to have a chat about it and, and find out what that might um, involve, then please reach out to me on LinkedIn forward slash P-E-I-T-A-M-D and we can certainly have a chat. Otherwise, I'll look forward to turning up in your earbuds next week. And remember, Advice Explorers, stay curious.